Hello, I'm Mike Sherwood Smith speaking to you from Edinburgh in Scotland. And uh, as you see, this is about the human affective system, and it's an application of the modular cognition framework, about which I will say a few words in the introduction. So here is an overview of the talk. Firstly, the introduction, then affect in the brain and in the mind, two different levels of description and explanation, important to keep distinct. Uh, then I'll look at values, perhaps the most important part of the affective system um, in this particular perspective, and then move on to emotions and end up with a summary. So here is the introduction. Uh, as I said, it's an application of the modular cognition framework. This is a uh, perspective, a view of the mind, uh, a way of researching the mind, if you like, uh, developed by myself and John Truscott over the last uh, 20 years. And it's uh, in continual development. And it can be elaborated by anyone who likes to use it. Um, um, and uh, in a sense, this will be a, a, an example of uh, how the cognition framework can be used. Um, in particular, I'd like to emphasize in this talk the way that um, uh, values, uh, the way we value things and uh, basic emotions um, really influence uh, every aspect of human behavior. Um, so the traditional distinction between um, mind and heart um, is very misleading. And we find that the heart has a much greater influence on the mind than we would like. Okay, so uh, in simple terms, uh, the mind is seen as a set of 11 specialized systems. Each has its own function and uh, its own organization. Um, and there are five of them in a sort of outer layer which are in direct contact with the outside environment and there are six inner or if you like deeper ones at a deeper level. Let's have a look at the outer ones. Uh, here we have uh, what will be immediately recognizable as um, uh, cognitive systems um, for processing and storing representations of a particular type uh, reflecting the five senses. Uh, at least four of them have the traditional uh, names. Uh, there's the auditory, that's to say hearing, uh, taste, seeing and smelling. Um, but um, here you might expect um, uh, touch, but touch is uh, just one part of the complex sense uh, that we now call the somatosensory sense. And I'm going to uh, use the word bodily to cover this. It's not a perfect way of uh, covering it, but I just will talk. I will just talk about uh, uh, bodily uh, sensations here, and um, and all of these um, have uh, parallels in the physical brain. Now, looking at the deeper system, uh, the system of. Uh, systems, uh, individual cognitive systems which are not in direct contact with the outside environment but have to rely on the outer ring for any uh, associations needed uh, with uh, what are originally the result of interactions between uh, the mind and the outside world. Um, and here they are, uh, we have six of them, we have the spatial system, we have the motor system uh, and we have the all-important conceptual system uh, which is uh, one particular one that makes us stand out from other species because it's particularly well developed in humans and it's not very certain uh, that all other species, uh, even mammals, have a conceptual system uh, at all but in any case uh, the human conceptual system is absolutely enormous. If I were to represent it in terms of size, it would be very a very large uh, box. Anyway, uh, the human conceptual system is where abstract meanings are stored and processed, and uh, there's good evidence that the brain has its own conceptual system um, uh, also. 
Uh, but I've left one out, haven't I? And that is indeed the one I'm going to concentrate on, and that is the effective system. So there they are. Uh, I should also mention, uh, for those who are not so familiar with the modular cognition uh, perspective on the mind, um, every of one of these systems um, that are uh, collaborating with each other, interacting with each other, but in a sense are unique. Each of them have a speci specific function. Um, e uh, each of them nevertheless have uh, the same basic architecture, simple architecture. Because we're talking about the abstract level of the mind, uh, we can talk in terms of boxes and circles. Of course you don't have boxes and circles in your brain, um, but here at this level we can talk about this. Um, and each has a processor and a store. And the store is where uh, representations are uh, kept or located and they can be active or inactive. But when they're activated, here we have a set of uh, representations which have been activated on a particular occasion uh, in uh, the course of online processing. Uh, the mind is uh, very active at the moment and it's processing these ones. Um, and here they are in a state of activation and what the processor does it makes sense of these uh, uh, activated ones or the ones which are perhaps most activated most dominating um, because some of them will be competing um, so the most dominant ones are being put together into some coherent shape um, coordinating them in some coherent manner uh, and how do they do that um, how do they make uh, a more complex representation out of the ones that happen to be active in the store. They do it according to uh, their own particular unique principles. So this is what makes each uh, particular uh, uh, system that I've represented, these 11 systems, uh, what makes them particular is the unique set of principles. So in other words, uh, the visual representation, human visual representations will be organized according to the principles of human vision, um, uh, whereas uh, human auditory uh, representations in the human auditory store will be organized by the processor according to human auditory principles which will be different from visual pr principles and principles in any other of those 11 systems. Turning now to affect in the brain and mind, um, uh, we can look at the affective system in two distinct ways. Um, firstly, we can look at it in its uh, physical manifestation uh, in the brain and the physical brain, um, and then we'll be looking at the neural system. Uh, and secondly, we can look at it in a more abstract way um, as a mind, that is to say, as a cognitive system. And the ways we look at it will be very different according to which level we're looking at. Uh, but of course the ultimate target uh, for science is to be able to map one onto the other. So our kind of map of the mind needs to be mapped onto the neural map, vice versa. So scientists working in both areas uh, need to uh, cooperate and um, find uh, uh, ways of, uh, of connecting up uh, what we understand at the cognitive level uh, with what we understand of the mind uh, at the neural level if we're going to understand um, uh, more about who we are uh, as humans, how we work and, uh, and how uh, to explain our behaviour. Now contemporary views uh, on the brain describe the emotional system, the aff affective system, uh, as concentrated in uh, not one specific location, uh, the so-called traditional limbic system, but more as a network involving uh, areas in the limbic system, uh, but as a network distributed uh, more widely over a number of different locations, so in a more brain-wide sense. Um, and this will involve uh, parts of the brain which uh, uh, are in evolutionary terms older, uh, namely the uh, reptilian and mammalian brains, 
as, as they are just sometimes described, plus areas in the newer neocortex, uh, which is so well developed in humans. There will be two follow-up videos. Uh, one follow-up video will develop this topic a little for those particularly interested in language cognition, in uh, how language is represented and uh, how language is acquired. And uh, the third part will continue in the same vein as today, looking at human cognition in general. And the focus in this talk will be on how the affective system works in the mind as a whole. Um, this means um, we're going to be talking about its continual persistent influence on cognitive processing in general and also uh, indeed about the central role of value representations. There will be two follow-up videos. Part two will develop this topic for those particularly interested in language cognition. And part three will elaborate further on uh, what we've been doing so far, namely talking about the effective system for uh, areas of human cognition in general um, and other than language. And the focus in this talk will be on how the affective system works in the mind as a whole. Um, this means um, we're going to be talking about its continual persistent influence on cognitive processing in general and also uh, indeed about the central role of value representations. There will be two follow-up videos. Part two will develop this topic for those particularly interested in language cognition. And part three will elaborate further on uh, what we've been doing so far, namely talking about the effective system for uh, areas of human cognition in general um, and other than language. So now we turn to values. Now, what are values? Um, well, the first thing to say is that um, affect cannot be divorced from cognition in general and uh, this is all bound up with the notion of value. So. Um, if you think of the mind having um, hundreds and thousands of representations uh, but um, uh, in different systems, remember the mind is um, a network of collaborative systems, each of them with their special function and each of these has a store in which there are representations um, built, shaped in a particular way according to the principles of that system. But um, they can be attached to a value, and this value will have a crucial effect on uh, both its development, acquisition, and also in online processing. So, like any other system, the effective system consists of a, a processing function, a processor, and uh, a store where the representations are located and indeed processed. And uh, the value representations in the effective store are primitives. That's to say, uh, they are representations which um, are there from the start. That, that, in other words, they are part of our starter set, our biological starter set. Uh, we inherit them. <coughs> They're there uh, from the very beginning. And each system, by the way, has primitives. So um, values will be uh, there on their own as uh, uh, individual um, positive or negative uh, representations uh, of value uh, but they will also be combinable and are often combined um, as component representations of a larger composite representation and uh, the kind that we associated with affect are the basic emotions. I'm not going to go into the details of that now uh, because we're going to focus on value. So values play a crucial role in online processing. They influence the activation levels 
of the representations that they are associated with. So, um, to go into more detail, right, with their, it can be either negative or positive, and um, they can vary in their intensity, uh, that's to say the degree to which they can be activated, um, um, and indeed uh, they may have a higher or lower activation resting level um, uh, when they're combined with other representations. So certain preset value associations are also part of our starter set. That's to say um, uh, not just uh, the representation the uh, itself but also the, the primitives, not just the primitives sitting in their individual stores but also relations associations between those particular primitives and some other representation elsewhere. I'm going to illustrate this in a moment. Um, uh, this is necessary uh, because we need to survive from the very beginning, so we have to have certain associations straight off from the very start. But of course um, many other associations will be learned and they will accumulate over the lifetime. Um, <clears throat> okay, this is just a quick eye, but this time we've chosen a positive, uh, a positive um, associations and you see the association between this positive um, value and um, various other representations um, is already quite high you know uh, this would be low but this is resting um, at a relatively high position um, which means it doesn't have far to go to be in, uh, activated uh, very very intensely indeed so it's there at its resting level uh, uh, associated with for example a visual structure let's say uh, the visual representation of a, a cheesecake or an apple or something like that. Uh, this means that for that individual, um, uh, even in a resting state, uh, this particular uh, image, uh, or uh, it's not actually an image of course, it's a representation which produces the sensation of an image, um, uh, will already be valued uh, highly. It will have a high activation level and that will have implications for how accessible it is. The same for a, a gustatory structure, a taste, certain taste may be very positive, right, set very positive, uh, may be useful for survival for example, um, uh, that, um, certain things will be uh, unpleasant or pleasant uh, because they may be relatively bad or good with regard to um, optimizing your survival and so on and so forth. But you can see that just these kinds of uh, sensory perceptual associations will accumulate rapidly throughout your lifetime as you, as you go through different experiences. Now here's an example of um, what you might call an innate response, that's to say a primitive association uh, between a value uh, um, representation and something else. Um, and it's the parachute response. Now, what is the parachute response? Well, the parachute response is um, is uh, demonstrated uh, by if you're holding a very young baby. I don't recommend you do this, um, but let's say you're holding it uh, very tenderly in your arms uh, like this, and uh, you suddenly make a movement backwards. Right now, this mo m movement backwards is detected by the baby of course and the parachute response is to simply throw out its hands to protect itself as a, as if it were about to fall. Um, this is the parachute response and it's there right at the beginning with uh, babies and uh, it's one of the things that doctors check to see that everything is okay. Uh, and in this case uh, what it is basically is a, a negative association with a, per a particular sensation and the sensation is a representation in the somatosensory, uh, uh, somatosensory system and of course to get the physical response of throwing out of the arms and, and the legs uh, you'll need to have a further association with the, the motor system. So these, this, this thing, the sensation of falling and the parachute response um, are, are, are there because they are associated with a negative value, um, basically danger and you don't have to learn this. So um, uh, there uh, 
uh, suddenly uh, you have this sensation of falling uh, whether or not you do fall or, uh, or not that's a matter for the parent presumably the parent will just um, or the doctor will not let you fall in uh, but in any case you have you see the baby has this uh, a reaction a sensation of falling and that um, already high uh, level at the resting level of activation uh, quickly attains a very intense level up here um, and um, so does the association with the motor system so very quickly you'll have an immediate uh, primitive response uh, which is called the parachute response here's a, another example of a of a response that you might learn now in cats interestingly enough it is claimed that cats have a primitive response to snake-like shapes so uh, in the case of the cat uh, it would be very much like the first example however I'm going to assume that um, there are various things uh, that we might uh, be scared of automatically you know as, as young children um, but I'm going to assume that a snake response seeing a snake uh, is a learned response right something which um, an individual has uh, acquired uh, by dint of uh, personal experience so um, uh, spotting a snake right so what the situation here again a negative value at a high resting level that's the the primitive uh, being associated um, in advance preset as it were a preset association uh, at high because you're going to need it and you're going to have to need a quick response it's got to be very accessible yeah. so there it is uh, connected with a snake like shape right and um, associated with a, a some kind of withdrawal response that withdrawal response of course uh, will have to be um, will have to be um, made more complicated considering uh, which particular cert are you standing in a river or are you on the ground or are you amongst trees with lots, lots of obstacles but the basic withdrawal response is already there right so um, at the moment we got our uh, human being here uh, not our cat but our human being uh, looking at some identified object that has just caught her or his attention and uh, what happens then uh, it turns out to be a snake and immediately uh, from that relatively high resting level um, uh, the whole so set of associations uh, leap up into an intense level of association and uh, the person uh, initiates a withdrawal response so uh, whether this is a learned response in humans uh, not only cats or not I will leave that to the experts who know about these things so most value associations will be like this in the second example they will be formed during an individual's lifetime they will be learned and they will involve all kinds of representations across the whole mind and um, uh, for example uh, uh, certain meanings will accumulate over time and this will be very important for language um, and um, uh, because they will uh, usually uh, result in, uh, in the addition of a new word a meaningful word a connection between uh, a sound and uh, a meaning and um, these associations will uh, will develop over the lifetime as you accumulate a vocabulary in one or other of your languages then of course there are the uh, somatosensory um, associations which can be positive or negative um, and we saw that in example one and uh, smell uh, sensations um, uh, some smells uh, we regard as unpleasant from birth and it's probably because uh, there's some evolutionary story behind them there they contain some kind of poison um, um, taste sensations in the same way and uh, auditory associations as well certain sounds will be valued as more positive or negative and of course a lot of those will be learned uh, you'll have to learn that uh, an alarm bell means something negative right and a doorbell uh, you don't know it might mean something positive or negative that may not have one particular value assigned to it but if it has it will certainly uh, affect the processing 
and all, all cases um, um, don't get the idea that uh, these value associations are set uh, they can change from situation to situation uh, they can become more positive or less positive they can become more negative or less negative according to uh, the individual's assessment of the situation so certain things uh, will be more positive in some situations than in others um, well okay so I've talked about value because I think uh, very important and need to be stressed um, uh, but now uh, let's look at emotions now uh, well uh, of course it is a developing science and um, but uh, pioneers um, uh, in, in this uh, type of research have come up with a basic distinction between uh, basic emotions uh, they get different names according to the, to the researcher um, but basic emotions that you find also in clearly in animals uh, anger fear happiness surprise disgust etc and they reflect the basic uh, biological drives associated with survival of the individual and species such as thirst hunger and sex um, uh, and they're all part of the business of being attracted to something or uh, wanting to avoid um, so they're the basic emotions and um, they are uh, uh, complex structures composite representations as I said before uh, and they will include um, some kind of uh, value representation associated with them so there'll be uh, negative emotions basic emotions and positive basic emotions and as I said they're found in species other than humans now the more complex ones um, uh, sometimes people talk about the social emotions um, uh, and particularly in humans maybe possibly in uh, um, higher uh, primates uh, but um, uh, they include things like envy shame guilt embarrassment admiration nostalgia relief and they're rather complex uh, emotions uh, maybe some uh, extension of basic emotions but with a whole set of meanings uh, which we would have to uh, get by association with the conceptual system so a full description of complex emotions has to include an association of a basic emotion with some outside system the affective system and I'm thinking it's mostly the conceptual system the conceptual system where abstract meaning so there's layers of meanings added on to the primitive um, uh, basic emotion to make the whole complex representation and association um, um, reflect the, the, the sophisticated meanings that we associate with social emotions as opposed to primitive emotions uh, basic emotions and in all cases yes activated emotions will include value representations uh, and they'll be more or less negative or more or less positive um, and um, they will trigger multiple associations with systems across the brain so um, uh, so we are uh, ultimately emotional beings more than anything else and even in our cool rational um, state uh, we, are, we are much more affected by uh, uh, affective representations that we than we would like to think um, and um, one thing I should notice no, note uh, is that uh, basic and complex emotions uh, when they're intensely activated will automatically trigger awareness of uh, the emotional state in question so um, anything that reaches um, or can reach uh, a high intense level of, a, of, um, uh, of activation uh, will automatically um, generate uh, an experience of um, awareness or uh, conscious awareness uh, and this uh, probably true of animals as well um, um, and that's all part of the story of consciousness which is something that I deal with elsewhere so just to summarize um, affect has a continual and persistent influence on cognitive processing in general right that's that was the first point the second point was negative and positive value uh, play a central role these are representations in the affect system 
which play a central role. And the third point is that these value representations are primitives. They're there, they're part of our starter set. And then the fourth point was representations of emotion will always contain a value component, positive or negative. And basic emotions may well be composite representations in the affective system alone. That's the kind of default assumption that we're making. And finally, the representations of complex social emotions require something else. They require associations between uh, the uh, uh, the representations in the affective system and uh, they and the conceptual system to give them those extra layers of meanings that we associate with these more uh, elaborate sophisticated emotions and that really is um, uh, as much as I have to say about uh, affect um, right now but um, I am planning uh, as I mentioned uh, two more follow-up representations. The next one will be for those who are particularly interested in uh, how language sits in our heads, how it relates to um, other languages that we might uh, you be uh, using, um, and um, how language uh, affect um, is involved in development, um, um, and this includes both acquisition and attrition over time. So uh, I'll close now for now. I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, please send me in questions um, and uh, comments. I'd be very happy. And of course, if you care to subscribe to this channel, I'd be even happy.